Welcome to the first of four videos on the most common biological molecules. These, this first video will cover carbohydrate chemistry, but there will be subsequent videos on both uh, the lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. For right now, what, what I'd like you to be, to be familiar with is the concept that all bio biological molecules, regardless of whether or not we're focusing on carbohydrates, are all going to be classified as organic molecules. Now, organic molecules do not mean that these molecules come from whole foods or that they're somehow grown without pesticides. What it refers to is the fact that all of these molecules contain the element carbon. Now, of course, they don't only contain the element carbon. They're also going to contain the elements oxygen and hydrogen. And in varying proportions, um, we're often going to see uh, phosphorus, sulfur, or nitrogen. That's all going to depend on the biological molecule in question. Carbohydrates in general are composed of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen exclusively. Well, what are carbohydrates? Carbohydrates really are sugars and starches. Um, there are other types of carbohydrates, but primarily as an American, most of your dietary calories come from carbohydrates, which isn't always a good thing. Um, regardless, all monosaccharides uh, are going to serve as the molecular building block of any carbohydrate in question. And again, the three most uh, common elements that are found in carbohydrates are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, if you're, if you're ever uncertain as to whether or not you're looking at a carbohydrate, one easy way to tell is to look at the molecular formula. And if you see a molecular formula where there are twice as many hydrogen atoms as either carbon or oxygen atoms, there's a pretty good chance that what you're looking at is a carbohydrate. Uh, these are the primary energy source for living organisms, so obviously they're very important in the study of biology. And we're going to see that carbohydrates come in three general forms. Monosaccharides, the simplest of all carbohydrates the disaccharides, the slightly more complex carbohydrates, and the polysaccharides, the most complex form of carbohydrates. Let's start uh, our study of carbohydrates with a, a look at the monosaccharides. Um, I'd like you to be familiar with three, uh, excuse me, four uh, types of monosaccharides. Those monosaccharides are glucose, fructose, galactose, and ribose. And if you look at the molecular formula for glucose, fructose, and galactose, what you're going to find is that all three of these monosaccharides have the same molecular formula. But these are different molecules, so what does that mean? Well, what we're dealing with are structural isomers. And if you remember from the reading from a couple nights ago, you'll recall that structural isomers are molecules with the same molecular formula, but different structural formulas. So glucose, fructose, and galactose all have the same atoms, but those atoms are going to be arranged in different configurations so as to make one molecule different from another. Why do we care? Well, because often in biology, the structure of a molecule tells us something about the function of the molecule. And in the case of glucose, fructose, and galactose, all three of these molecules are going to have different functions based on their structures. Um, in the case of glucose, this is going to be the most common monosaccharide. We're going to see it everywhere. It is the primary source of cellular energy. In fact, your brain cells can only use glucose as a source of, of carbohydrate. Fructose is found in fruit. Galactose is found in milk. If we contrast these three monosaccharides with the monosaccharide ribose, ribose is a little bit different, only five carb atoms compared to the six carbon atoms found in glucose, fructose, and galactose. The molecular formula different from what you saw in glucose, fructose, and galactose, which of course suggests that the structure of ribose will be different than the structure of either glucose, fructose, or galactose. Moving on to the disaccharides, the slightly more complex form of carbohydrates. Uh, a disaccharide is simply two monosaccharides linked together. Um, so we can see here, in the case of maltose, that two molecules of glucose are being linked together in a dehydration reaction. How do we know that it's dehydration? We can see the water molecule that's going to be produced. And through that dehydration reaction, we're going to form a new chemical bond. That chemical bond is here. Uh, and that chemical bond has a name. The name of the chemical bond that is going to form when two monosaccharides are linked together to form a disaccharide, or really any uh, more complex carbohydrate, is a glycosidic bond. Uh, you don't need to concern yourselves with the numbers that you see here. The numbers just simply refer to the carbon atoms in each of the monosaccharides that are being linked together to form the disaccharide. So here you'll see that it's a 1,4 linkage. Down here you'll see that it's a 1,2 linkage. Again, don't worry about that. Focus instead on the fact that we're dealing with a new chemical bond forming between the two monosaccharides, and the name of that bond is a glycosidic bond. Uh, there are three types of disaccharides that I'd like you to be familiar with. 
The first is sucrose, the second is lactose, and the third is maltose. Notice again that all three of these molecules have the same molecular formula, which suggests that they have different structural formulas. Uh, and in fact, the, all three of these molecules are structural isomers of each other. Um, the sucrose, uh, again, as a disaccharide, is composed of two monosaccharides. The monosaccharides that make up sucrose are glucose and fructose. The monosaccharides in lactose are glucose and galactose. In maltose, simply two glucose molecules linked together. But we saw that on the previous slide. Um, sucrose you're going to find in all of your table sugar. This is the white crystalline solid that you add to your brownies, cakes, pies, cookies. Uh, lactose is the sugar that makes milk slightly sweet. Uh, and maltose, we live in St. Louis after all, is the sugar that is fermented by yeast in the production of beer. Why should we care about disaccharides and the structure of disaccharides? Well, take a look at the molecules that I have here on the screen. Uh, you might be familiar with a molecule called uh, Splenda. The, bio, the chemical name of Splenda is sucralose. You can see that up here. And Splenda is an artificial sweetener. Well, perhaps you've seen the commercial for Splenda that suggests that Splenda is a zero-calorie sweetener. Have you ever asked yourself why Splenda is a zero-calorie sweetener? It has a lot to do with the structure of the molecule. Well, on the top here, we can see the structure of sucrose. How, how do we know that it's sucrose? Because it's composed of glucose and fructose. And what I want you to notice is that in the case of Splenda, Splenda is a modified form of sucrose. So when they say Splenda comes from sugar, or it's made from sugar, so it tastes like sugar, that shouldn't really shock us because, you know, if you look at the structure on the, at the top of the screen compared to the structure at the bottom of the screen, these two molecules look somewhat similar to each other. But what I want you to focus on are the green atoms that I've circled for you. These are, of course, chlorine atoms. Those chlorine atoms are not going to be found in the structure of sucrose. They are found in the atom, uh, sorry, in the molecule of sucralose. So what makes sucralose so different from a molecule of sucrose is the presence of those chlorine atoms. Because of those chlorine atoms, sucralose cannot be broken down by your body. Sucrose, of course, because it lacks those chlorine atoms, can be broken down by your body. Uh, we can go one step further and we can see that, in fact, many of these chlorine atoms are actually replacing hydroxyl groups in the structure of the molecule. Something to focus in on as you review the functional group chemistry that we talked about in class earlier in the week. Let's move on to the polysaccharides. There are three types of polysaccharides with which I'd like you to be familiar. These polysaccharides are uh, starch, cellulose, and glycogen. All three of these polysaccharides are going to be composed of glucose molecules linked together through dehydration reactions and glycosidic bonds. But where we find these polysaccharides is going to be different. So for example, starch is found exclusively in plants, and it's the primary energy storage molecule in plants. Cellulose, also only found in plants, is going to be part of the cell wall. Maybe you learned about that a little bit in middle school. Um, so the cellulose molecules will provide structural support. Glycogen is the one polysaccharide that is found in animals exclusively. Um, again, composed of multiple glucose molecules linked together um, through dehydration reactions and glycosidic bonds, but it will serve as the primary energy storage molecule in animals rather than the starch molecules that are found in plants. Here's a little bit about this, uh, of the structure of these molecules, and we'll um, be learning more about this in class uh, this week. The starch molecule is a coiled molecule. You can see that coil up here on the screen. Okay. Cellulose is very different from, uh, from starch. Cellulose, instead of it forming a coil, actually forms long linear chains. Um, which is going to, as you'll see in the next slide, lend to its um, structural support in plants. Glycogen, a little bit different. There are branches that form off of a central chain of glucose molecules. And you can see one of the branches is highlighted here in this part of the picture. Again, this isn't about memorizing the structure of these biological molecules. What I'm trying to show you is that each of these polysaccharides has a unique structure, and those structures often have tell you something about the function of those molecules uh, within cells in living organisms. Uh, let's focus on cellulose as an example of how the structure of the molecule contributes to its function. 
Um, because of the linear array of glucose molecules in a chain of cellulose, what we end up with are long molecules that are very straight. And those straight molecules are capable of stacking on top of each other, almost like the bricks in a brick wall, to lend structural support to the overall complex of molecules. So when we say cellulose is involved in structural support, this hopefully is beginning to make a lot of sense because these molecules can stack on top of each other um, to form, well, to form a wall, much like we see in the cell wall. In addition, each of these linear chains of carbohydrates are held together by a hydrogen bond, and hopefully you can see that right here. I warned you that hydrogen bonding was not going to go away. In this case, the hydrogen bonds are forming between two hydroxyl groups on neighboring chains of cellulose molecules. Starch is a little bit different. Um, again, starch is going to be the coiled molecule. We don't really see that here in the simplified diagram, but we'll see in class why starch is an important biological molecule and how its structure contributes to its function. Uh, at this point, that's, this is the end of the carbohydrate section of the biological uh, molecule video series. Hopefully this uh, has been helpful, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have in class later this week.